Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Today we're going to talk about evaluating the Prespiope, and we're going to do, give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to do that with our two wonderful speakers. Many of you know Dr. Sandra Black. She's a regular on our webinars. She's a camera inlay patient, by the way, and um, she's a vice president and director of clinical operations at Crystal Clear Vision in Toronto, Canada. They have been implanting the camera inlay for many years. We also have our own Dr. Patty Atche. Patty's also a camera inlay patient, and she's an optometrist and one of our clinical specialists working with our, our accounts and our surgeons in the field and, and around the world. So we want to please give them a warm welcome, and um, we're really excited to have them share their insights today on some of the best tools for evaluating the Presbyope and identifying the best patients that we can get per camera. So thanks to both of you. We really appreciate you joining us. And um, I think we'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Black, to get us started. Thank you so much. Um, so this is going to be, Patty and I are going to spend a lot of time kind of discussing between us, you know, how we go through and how we talk to patients when they come into the practice. But really quickly, before we get into that, we just want to review um, the patient selection criteria. Most of you already know this, and we don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but there is a full webinar just on this topic that's available on the AccuFocus uh, YouTube channel. So if you need more information on this, you can look that up. If we want to move on, there we go. So what we're looking for, you know, first of all on this patient is that they really, really hate wearing reading glasses, that to them presbyopia is a real major disability. Um, and they're very motivated into this because anyone that has been doing this procedure for a while understands that this is not a wow factor, you know, day one where the patient will instantly be happy. There no doubt is a recovery process that the patient has to go, go through. And so we do want to make sure that we have the right patient and they are willing to go through that process with us that they're not going to get frustrated, you know, within the first six hours that they're not able to read. So they really have to hate their reading glasses, they really want to get rid of them, and they really do find that their near vision, the loss of near vision really is a disability to them. We move on. It's pretty easy when you're looking for a surgical candidate. We're going to do the same exclusion can, uh, criteria that we do for our LASIK or PRK patients. Obviously, if they have any type of uh, corneal disease, if they're keratoconic, if they have a severe, severe dry eye, um, any, of, any lens issues, anything that would stop you from moving forward and doing any type of refractive surgery, you have to look at this exactly the same. That patient is still not a good candidate for LASIK, uh, for camera, sorry. And you also want those patients, again, this is a refractive procedure, so we're looking for patients that you know, are not unrealistic. That patient that says to you from the get-go, if this is not perfect, I will not be happy. I hate the word perfect. And those patients that we all know in practice where you sit beside them, within five minutes you go, oh my God, this patient you know, is not totally normal and I certainly would never want to see myself beside them on a long distance flight. So any of those things are reasons to not move forward with this procedure. Patty, any other input on that? No, I think you hit it on the nail. If you just go with your gut instinct there. If you're not sure that they're going to be happy, if there's any doubt at all to, to the, where their mindset is, follow that. Yeah. Okay, so now we can move on to kind of what we do in day-to-day. -day. So I know that for us what we do um, is I always have, if I know that the patient coming in is presbyopic, I automatically will assume that they could be a, potentially be a camera candidate. So if they're for, over 45 um, and pre-cataract, then what our staff will do is they'll always do the AccuTarget result, they'll always do the AccuTarget um, readings before I actually see the patient. Um, they will do the, they'll check for um, the OSI, so check the lens scatter, They'll check the tear film, and we actually have them also do centration as well, just so I've got all the information so that when I see the patient, 
I can decide right there and then whether they are a good camera candidate. Um, then what I do is I refract the patient and I check their dominant eye. But what I have found is um, there's probably about you know 30% of cases where when I check the dominant eye the way I normally would, which is lining up a, uh, a triangle with their hands and a letter and then determining which eye they're actually sighting with, I actually will find that when I check them behind the foropter once I've refracted them and they <clears throat> And I check them for tolerance to blur, so I just add plus on each eye individually and see which eye they can actually tolerate blur from the most. In a lot of cases, I find that those patients where I thought they might be left eye dominant actually tolerate blur better on that eye. So we will always put the inlay in the eye that they can tolerate better blur. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, and that's, that's crucial, especially if you have someone who they can go either way. I think it's my right, maybe it's my left. That's really important to make sure that you do challenge it with a plus one, a 125, whether it's behind the foropter or, or trial framed, because you really do, that. sometimes those are the patients that it's okay, but they never really fully adapt to having the camera in. It could be that it's not truly in their non-dominant eye. Yeah, it, it was kind of shocking to me when I first started doing the tolerance to blur how different those results can be sometimes. Yeah. What's your criteria, Patty, just for refraction, um, where you make the decision on whether or not that patient should have just the inlay only or versus having LASIK as well as a camera inlay? Part of what I look at is their age, if they're a young presbyo and what their, um, you know, what their, their occupation is and the, the overall, if, if they're slightly myopic already or if they're a light, low hyperope, how much of a difference there is between the manifest refraction and the cyclo. Um, if they're a, a young presbyo, I tend to like to leave them a little bit more myopic, more towards the minus 75, even a minus one if, if they tolerate that. If they're an older um, presbyo, then I'll t you know, tend to go more towards the minus a half to minus 75, but always trying to go to that, that sweet spot of, of slightly myopic to help them. Yes, totally, totally agree with that one. Um, but one thing you said that was, I think, really crucial is that we always make this assumption that once the patient is presbyopic, they have no more accommodation. And a lot of times you, we forget to do a cyclo refraction, and it's shocking how much extra plus you can pull out when you actually cycle please some of these presbyo. So and, definitely, you know, you know, you have to make sure you do that. And what do you, um, what do you consider okay for the dominant eye? If the dominant eye is like plus a half, are you going to do LASIK on that eye, or what's your cutoff for that? You know, it, it definitely, having the camera eye, and, and we've had this occur, and I'm sure you have as well with patients when they are that, maybe plus a half, plus 75, they're 20-20 in that dominant eye, but as soon as you have the, the camera in the non-dominant eye, suddenly they're noticing that they're not seeing well in, in that dominant eye. So that's something that we just really need to explain to the patients as well. Trial frame it for them as, you know, to, so they can feel the comfort by, by having that, that dominant eye corrected to Plano. That's really, really important. Even though they are maybe just a plus 50, a plus 75, 20-20, balancing it out, giving them Plano there helps them. Yeah, 100%. We've gotten burned a few times like that. So if they're anything above plus a half, we're definitely thinking about doing LASIK and making them yeah. Plano on that dominant eye. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we do our normal, our normal examination, our normal refractive examination, obviously, slit lamp, pachymetry, everything else that we have to do. Um, and then, you know, I definitely found it really helpful to explain to a patient, showing them that pinhole, um, you know, showing it to them and, and so that they can actually see the difference once they've got that pinhole in front, how this is going to improve their vision up close. They're kind of shocked that it, it works so well because it's such a simple right. device. Now, are you using pinhole, Sandra, with trial frame or just loose lenses or behind the foropter? We, I use it with, um, we actually have that, um, I don't even know what it's called, that little occluder that we can open and close with the multiple pinholes. Right, Larnet. Yeah, so that's what I'll use right. for the patients. What do you use? Yeah. 
I like to use the uh, the loose trial lenses. One thing to keep in mind is not using the ferropter because it really doesn't give them a, a good feeling. There, it gives them much more of a tunnel vision feeling than if you do either the trial frame or the loose lenses. If you're putting it in the trial frame, remember to make sure that that pinhole is, is centered on their line of sight. Otherwise, they're tilting their head up or down, and that doesn't give them a real good um, feeling of what, what it's going to be like. But, but pinhole, like you said, I think is, is crucial to show them. And you do, you get that wow, especially if it's someone that's gone from J10 to, to J1. I mean, bingo, you've got an ideal patient. But for those that are maybe Gen, J10 to J5, challenging it with that extra plus 75 at near that really helps them realize the importance of getting them down to that that sweet spot and it's it's nice not only for the patient but but um you know for for the od doing this or the md doing this to really see okay we, we really do have to get them to that sweet spot and if, if you have a patient that comes in that's in their mid-40s and when you start talking to them they say oh no i'm okay wearing reading glasses will you still <laughs> bring this up and kind of do the pinhole as well just so that they understand? Absolutely. It, it helps them, one, to see what technology we have to offer them when the time comes and they feel that, that you know, they are ready for it. And a lot of times they will say, oh, I'm fine wearing reading glasses. That'll probably last two or three weeks because then, the, you know, having to put them on and off, they, that gets old. So showing it to them and saying, that's fine. I just want you to, you know, experience what it'll be like when you decide to. And I'd say you know, nine out of 10 times, they, they suddenly, wow, it really is better if I have something for an ear. And that just helps them realize that now we can get rid of their distance glasses as well as get rid of their reading glasses. And it, it just helps to make that home, take that home for them. And if they realize, no, it's not that big of a difference, at least now they know that there is something for them. And they can also go and talk to their friends or relatives and say, you know, there is something out there to, to get rid of your reading glasses. Yeah, true. And it, it's funny because they have this thing in their head that when you use the term reading glasses that they're only going to need them for reading and nothing right. else. And I remember, you know, having patients come back going, but you didn't mention that I would need them for my crossword puzzles or I would need them, yeah. to, you know, to do everything. They don't understand how dependent we are on that distance. And, and it's right. shocking to, especially a myope, when all of a sudden they just can't do anything from arm's length in. Right, right. Our cell phones are always bad because we spend so much time on those. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just read a stat today that the average presbyo checks their cell phone 46 times a day. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it, That's it was a lot with us all the time. On. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we can move on. So you know, there's questions that both Patty and I we want to ask when that patient is sitting in the chair. Um, and, you know, like we said, we believe that every patient is definitely a camera inlay patient. Um, and, and we always want to presume that they are a candidate when they come in and then go from there, not presume they're not and go in the other direction. So there's certain questions that we always want to ask these patients so it come, becomes part of a discussion um, to determine if they are a good candidate. Moving on. So I think, you know, the very first one is, why are you here? Like, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve at this visit? And, you know, I know that it's, it's funny because just as we talked about a few minutes ago, when patients come in and they're wearing glasses, and especially when they're myopic, um, a lot of them will just tell you, the LASIK candidates will say, I just want to get rid of my distance glasses. Don't touch my reading. I read just fine. And so it really is a discussion on, you know, we can do that, but you are going to lose your reading. So we have to go through that and just balance it all out. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? No, I agree. I agree. Um, finding out the frustration level of the glasses, I think, is, is one of the key parts. For those people that are just once in a while just putting on readers or something, they're not going to have that big of, of a benefit. But for those patients, um, you know, that are constantly reaching for them, putting them on, taking them off, uh, you know, the frustrations there, that's, it, that's where you're going to get the best benefit. Who do you find are your more frustrated patients? 
Like I know oh. for us, the one thing I noticed are those patients that were always perfect their whole life, those those uh, yeah. mild hyperopes. Yeah, yeah. And this is just and killing them. They've always yeah, had they better. They turn 40 and call and say, I was fine until yesterday, and today I can't see it near what's going on. Right. It just kind of fell off. And they don't want to wear glasses because they never have to wear them. Their entire life, yeah. their vision has been perfect. It's been better than all their friends. Yeah. And, yeah. Then all and it's, it's harder, harder for them to accept. Yeah. And I know a lot of our, those patients come in from direct-to-consumer. They actually come in, they seek us out. They don't necessarily, they don't have an optometrist. They go, don't go see an optometrist. They just come in because they're frustrated from day one. Right, right. You know, I think this is really, really critical. You know, what, how do you spend your whole day? Do you spend your whole day on a computer? Do you spend your whole day, you know, on the golf course? What do you, what do, you do for a living? What's your job? Are you a long-distance truck driver? You know, what's, uh, what's your thought on that? That, that is, that is so important. And, and when I'm doing chart reviews, that's one of the questions I ask in the beginning is what does this person do? I look at the age, like we said earlier, and then what do they do? Um, is it someone, you, know, you could have a minus two that only puts their glasses on for driving at night when they're going home and during the day they're absolutely happy. They're probably not going to appreciate the camera um, vision as well, but you have that minus two that's constantly putting on and on the, off their glasses because they're on the computer, they're walking across the room and stuff, they're going to appreciate it. So it's important. Keep in mind too that some of these people, you know, your, your mechanics, your um, you know, plumbers that are, that are in bifocals now, they're looking down, sometimes they're having to look up, you know, they're going with the double D bifocal or something. This is great for them because now they can function looking at the machinery, looking up above at pipes and everything, and, and you know, um, it, it gives them that freedom that they haven't had. So I think it's really important to know what they're doing. Yes, it's true, especially if they've got a bifocal and they're set for two specific distances, and they have to actually yeah. adjust their working distance to get closer because of the, the actual glasses. Right. With, the yeah. inlay, with the inlay, they wouldn't have that. Exactly. Yeah, so it's definitely something that's really important. Do you take into account, um, like you said, a, a mechanic or a plumber, do you take into account lighting conditions where they work? Absolutely, and, and a lot of times they're having to use, you know, a flashlight or something to help them anyway. And I think just the, the fact that you've given them now that flexibility of the focus change without having to lift their glasses up and stuff, adding that little extra light is, is not an issue for them. They, they actually welcome it. And so you tell them, like we do, I assume, that they may need extra light in certain, certain conditions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I found, I'm sure you did as well, it, it is a slow healing process, but it just keeps getting better and better and better, that, that uh, extra light that you need right in the beginning when, when you get the inlay versus later on, seems to, it just works better. I, I can read menus now and, and dim light, whereas I would say maybe six months out, I, I, I was still having to, you know, look for extra lighting. So it just continues to get better and better. It's true. There's definitely neural adaptation. I found that between um, year two and year three was significant. I'm at four years now, and it, it, you're right, it gets better and better, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. 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 So this is another thing, you know, besides what do we do for work, what, what are our leisure activities, right? It's the same type of thing. There are people that just sit there and they love to do crossword puzzles or read all day long, and that's how they relax. And then there's, you know, the, the very active patient that, you know, if they're exercising regularly and, and do it, they don't want to be wearing glasses or contact lenses. They want to be able to see the instructor. They want to be able to see their Fitbit. They want to be able to see everything. You know, we're right. much more active, I think, than we ever were before. Yeah. You know, people that are playing golf, you know, they have to be able to see the ball. They have to be able to see the score sheet, but they have to be able to judge the greens. Um, this, is, this is ideal for that. You, you know, your hikers, your runners, any, anything, your basketball players, because keep in mind it's not monovision, so they're not losing that disparity, that, that binocularity, that depth perception. It actually, they're gaining it, so it, it makes a big difference. So that's also one thing that I ask. And something else I, I try to find out, it, it varies from state to state, but... Um, you know, are, are they looking through a scope at all, whether it's binoculars, whether it's, you know, a, a spotting scope, 
um, that's important as well to to make sure that you're putting it in the accurate eye to to um, to help them, you know, with spotting. So if you had a a person who did a lot of photography on the side, what would you, which eye would you put it in? Would you ever think about putting it in the the uh, dominant eye just so that they could see what they were doing up close on their camera, or would you tend to still go with the non-dominant eye? I've had a few photographers that we've done the inlay with, and we've continued to put it in their their non-dominant eye because when they're focusing through the scope, and we and we've had conversations with them. Um, when they're focusing through their camera, they want to be able to see the target clearly, and then you know it's it's more when they're just looking at at the screen with both eyes that they want to be able to see it. But that they prefer to have it in their non-dominant eye versus their dominant. Is there anybody that you've done the opposite? Not as far as photographers. We've had a couple that, um, um, as a sport, they they hunt. And um, it was cross dominancy per se, as far as eye and, and hand. And um, we did go ahead and put it in in the dominant eye because they actually scoped with the other eye, um, and that was more of an issue for them than just having it in their dominant eye. But I think we've done maybe just one or two that way. Well, yeah, we've uh, done a couple people that did triathlons and. They really appreciated that because if they, especially on the biking portion, when they're trying to check their time and they've got to see perfectly right. um, across it, they've got to be able to to quickly glance down and check where they're at, and and then also right. see what's going on in the road. And they couldn't wear glasses for that, and contact lenses right. didn't work because they were losing their reading or monovision, right? Right, right, right. So again, it's just important to to know your patient not just yeah. the refraction and the health of the eye, but what is their occupation? How do they spend their time? You know, if, if you have a person that's a, a um, manicurist, you know, it's real fine, fine detail that they're seeing all the time at near. You know, you have to really consider that if it is a good option for them or not. And I think it's also about counseling them, right, on managing mm -hmm. their expectations beforehand. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, how much time do you spend on the computer each day? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> that so includes think, phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, I think that one of the biggest things, I think this is great for people that spend all day long on the computer. They really do tend to get good vision with this. Um, yeah. And uh, But the only thing that I always like to, to counsel these people is they tend to stare. I know they'll yeah. sit on their computer for hours and they don't blink properly and they may have some dryness issues, which they would have had with their contact lenses or glasses. But, you know, if we want to maintain that good, clear, crisp vision, I really, I do spend some time talking to the patients and just telling them to keep those artificial tears close by and to make sure that they're using them regularly. Yeah, yeah. I recommend there's an app that I have patients put on their phone. It's called Alarm Me. And you can actually set it for, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever you want. Because we do, like you said, you, we all do it. You start concentrating, next thing you know, it's been two or three hours and you don't realize it. Um, so this way they can set it and, and it just rings for them. They put a drop in and keep on going. Oh, that's great. I think that's a great thing. What's that called again? Alarm me. Alarm me. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start using that one because I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so again, another really important thing that we have to know about those patients so that we can manage them pre-op um, and go through what their expectations would be. Allergies or have itchy eyes. So I don't know what it's like um, down where you are, but up here, this is the season. When we hit April, May, and September, October, this is where we get a lot of patients that have, you know, all this irritation and all this itchiness and, and uh, problems with their vision and problems with their eyes. Yeah. This year's been, I think, the worst with all the rain and, and storms that we've all been having. Yeah. And finding out, too, not only if they have the allergies and itchy eyes, but what are they taking for it? Right. Are they using yeah, antihistamines? Are they using nasal sprays? All those are factors as well with, with dry eyes. Yeah, do you get a, we get a lot of patients that will use Visine, and I just have to sit there and get them off the Visine, tell them to stop using yeah. that basal constrictor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, good old so over-the-counter to... uh, prescribing. <laughs> exactly. And then some people get confused, too, on what it, what's an itchy eye and what's a dry eye. Right? Their eyes are irritated and they just don't know what it is. So I think that's important. Uh, and these are the people that can't wear their contact lenses as well. Exactly. That's another good question. You know, how long can they wear their contacts? Are they someone that can go all day without having any problems or do they become irritating after, after a couple of hours? Sometimes it's not just a, you know, try to fit them with a contact lens that's got more water content. It's, it's just the, the tear film stability, the dryness that, that could be an issue for them. Right. And the patients that are coming in that are wearing contact lenses that are coming in that are good camera candidates, a lot of times they're wearing their contacts and now they're wearing their reading glasses as well. So they've right. got the frustration of the reading glasses and then they've got the the eyes getting irritated with their contact lenses, so it's a double whammy. Any questions that we forgot? Like, can you think of anything else that we didn't put in here that we should be that we should be talking to patients about or asking? We tend to, to discuss it with anybody forty and over. And even if it's someone that's coming in that's your quote unquote happy monovision patient. Talk to them about it as well, because sometimes it's okay for them, but you know they're having nighttime driving issues, they feel that imbalance and stuff. Go ahead and again, show that pinhole to them because you may well, Sandra, you were one of those who I went from what twenty yeah twenty one hundred to distance, and what did you improve to when you when you got the so MRI I went put from in? I had monovision done in nineteen ninety eight when I was forty, and you can do the math and figure out I'm old now. <laughs> And I grew out of it, you know, at about 47, 48, so I started having to wear reading glasses. I wore night driving glasses from day one because I was. I was about 21.50. I, I was minus one and a quarter um, in the non-dominant eye. And when I got the inlay, I, my distance vision came up in that eye to 20.40, so yeah. I no longer need night driving glasses anymore, and I'm reading everything without glasses. So yeah. it's completely different than monovision. I think the other thing that I found with monovision was there was always an area of blur. So if I would, especially shopping, I would either have to get a little bit closer, a little bit farther away to kind of see the price tags. I, I was always uncomfortable at, at that, uh, that intermediate distance. It was a little odd, which I don't have anymore. Now it's totally natural and totally comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. So remember, remember to show that to your like I said, your quote-unquote happy monovision patients, because sometimes just by placing the inlay, it now improves that, that you know, disparity that they were having in the distance, and they're not losing their near. Right, and they've gotten very used to it, so they figure this is the best that they can do, not realizing right. that there is a better option out there. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that one of the things that, you know, we have to, to remember is that most of our presiopes are really good camera candidates. You know, we shouldn't be thinking of um, only specific patients. We should start thinking of every single presbyope as being a potential camera patient. Right. You know, it just really increases the market for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we have this tendency to put people in a box and we really shouldn't do that. We yeah. have to definitely always think that they're a good candidate. Um, and, you know, both of us spend, a lot, spend time with our patients just making sure that we understand how they spend their day-to-day. -day. What do they do with their vision? How do they work? What is their social life like? And what their expectations are, right? I, I will say to patients, the goal, we can never make you 20 again. We want to make you as independent of glasses as we possibly can. But there may be situations where you may need more light. There may be situations when you're looking at something really tiny and you may need a little bit more magnification, but the goal is to make you as glasses-free as we possibly can throughout the day. And I think that the, with healing time, I think it's really important, you know, if you say to a patient beforehand, like I always say to patients, look, it took me about six weeks before I was really clear. It took Dr. Mashap, my surgeon, when he had it done, it took, he was reading the next day. So I say to patients, there are, you know, 20% of patients that, yeah, you'll see well the next day, but for the majority of patients, it can take a month or two for everything to come in and be comfortable. And I think that we really do have to be honest with these patients um, at the, from the get-go, 
so that they don't come in and, and feel like we've lied to them. And as soon as you, if you say to them, it will be blurry day one, when they come in and it's blurry, they go, yeah, things are great. It's exactly how you said, it's blurry. Right, right. I tend to tell patients, um, especially those that have already had LASIK, they had it you know, years ago, whichever, I tell the, tend to tell them that it's definitely not like LASIK. You're not going to get that immediate wow. Um, think of it more as cosmetic surgery. They may have had cosmetic surgery. They may know somebody or they've seen the reality TV shows. With cosmetic surgery, they know that eventually they're going to get to that wow, it's beautiful, that, but it's a slower healing process. There's more swelling. You know, you, if you've watched the TV shows, there's, you know, there's bandaging. There's all this stuff going on, bruising. Now, obviously, we're not putting bandages on the eyes or anything, but it is a smaller, um, smaller, slower healing process. And once they, they make that correlation to, okay, it's like cosmetic surgery. It's going to be slower. I get it. They do understand it. So they understand that, you know, it may be a month before I'm starting to see better and better. But, but I think that helps them understand that it's not going to be the next day, wow, like Lasix gives them. Yeah, yeah, totally. What do you um, what do you say to patients if they say, "Well, I have to work next week. What if I can't read?" I tell you know, avoid your glasses as much as possible. I think that's crucial to help with that neuroadaptation. But obviously, life goes on. If you have to see something and you can't, you know, put the glasses on, but take them off as soon as you can. If if you're lucky enough that it's on the computer, increase the font. Um, look for better lighting, but if you have to, definitely put them on, take them off as soon as you can. You really want to work on that neuroadaptation to help the eyes just to to, to function and, and focus better and better. Yeah, no, totally agree on that one because you don't want the patient to feel like they've got to suffer for the next right. month so they can't work because that's going to hold them back from doing surgery. But, you know, you want to make them understand that they do need to let their brain do some of this as well so they can't become too right. dependent on them. Right. So I think we're probably ready to take on questions, unless you can think of anything. Can you think of anything, Patty, that we missed? I don't think so. No, I think we've covered what you and I have both gone through. So <laughs> what we live day in and day out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, we do have a couple questions, um, and for those of you um, who haven't sent in a question yet or something else has come up, go ahead and use the chat box to provide us a question, and, and we'll go ahead and answer those now. Um, but we do have a few already, so um, I'll ask the question and then direct it to one of you, and then if um, the other one has um, anything in addition to add, please jump in, okay? Um, so one of the questions is, what is your suggested age range for young versus older presbyope? Sandra, you want to take that first? So, you know, we do things, what I generally do is if, if I have a patient that is in their early 40s, so they're just about to start and they come in um, not because they're necessarily having reading problems but because they want LASIK, what I will tell them is, you know what, let's just do this little bit of monovision that's going to get you through the next couple years, and then you'll come back as your presbyopia progresses and I explain all that to them, then we'll, we'll put in the inlay then. I do, though, it's really funny because I do have some patients that even in their early 40s will say, you know what, I don't want to come back, let's just do it all now. And by all means, we have no problem doing that. Obviously, it's much easier for them to adapt to that. I'll also tell the patients that if they can't get used to that little bit of monovision, um, to come back earlier and we'll put in the inlay because that will then make them more binocular. Yeah, I agree. Anything? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, great. A um, couple more questions. Um, if the patient says, and I think you talked a little bit about this, um, but I think it um, maybe we need a little a bit more explanation on it. But if a patient comes in and they say that they're fine, you know, having reading glasses, what exactly do you say to the patient? And, and what exactly do you, do you do? So I'm going to walk in and you're talking to me about the inlay and I say, you know what, I, I'm really fine having these reading glasses. Patty, you want to take that one first? Oh, if, if they're in um, just distance glasses, um, I will go ahead and have them keep their distance glasses on, show them what LASIK will be, how it will be, you know, further distance. And then I go ahead and have them read. 
And then you may say, well, no, I usually take my glasses off to read. Well, exactly. Once you have the LASIK done, it'll be like keeping your glasses on so you see that it's going to be difficult for you to read. Um, and then, again, that wonderful pinhole. I show them the pinhole, see how well it'll be. If you have this done, you'll be able to read. Have them look at distance. They can still see their distance just to help you understand what that is. And then, depending on the age, putting that plus 75 in front of them just to bring it in even to better focus. Um, just to help them understand that, yes, you do. You have some people that say, oh, I'm fine. I'll be putting my reading glasses on. But just give them that visual of we really can get rid of all of it for you. Yeah. They don't really get it. They don't understand yeah. until they actually live it. Great. Thanks. A um, couple more questions. The next one is, how do you explain to a 2020 patient who's mildly hyperopic that they need LASIK first? Who do you want to go for that one? <laughs> How about Sandra, you take it this one this time. Okay, so what we do is, what I do is I will always say to them, look, your eyeball is too short. It's always been too short. And I bring out my little eye model and I say to them, and the light focus is back here. And you know, when you were younger, you had this very, very flexible lens that would pull the focus forward, and it would make your vision absolutely perfect, and you would see better than all your friends. And they always nod at that because they get it. And then it would pull the focus even further forward for reading. Well, now the lens is starting to harden, and the first thing that's gone is the reading, and now your distance has gone a little bit. And you've probably noticed that you're not seeing, even though you can still read that bottom line, it's not quite as sharp as it used to be. And they go, yeah, you're right. So that's how I explain to them that they actually do have a distance correction that we have to take care of. And I find that works really well. So then when I say to them, so we have to correct that first, or you're always going to be trying to use that lens inside your eye, and that's going to throw everything off. They just have to understand that it's not, that we're not lying to them, that this isn't something that, uh, you know, that this is real, and when you start to say to them that you used to have this absolutely perfect vision and you don't anymore, they go, yeah, you're right. Yeah. They do recognize it. They just haven't all put it all into context. Oh, great point. Patty, anything, uh, anything to add to that? No, I agree. I agree 100%. And um, we have another question, kind of along the same lines as your camera question, but... Um, it, it, this practice, I guess, last night the, the surgeons were were talking about this, and they said they weren't sure which eye um, to put the camera in for a hunter. Uh, one doctor thought it was the dominant, and the other said um, non-dominant. Um, they want to ma make sure that they can see the sight at the end of the rifle. What are your thoughts on that? We'll start with uh, you, Patty. I think with, with your hunters, anyone that's using some type of ocular, um, what I experienced in the beginning, and Sandra, I, I don't know if you did or not, but um, when I first approached an ocular foot lamp, surgical scope, um, I would see the image of my inlay just for a couple of seconds, and then it would disappear. I'd have that retinal image show up. And that's something you just need to discuss to them. Um, you know, surgeons, orthodontists that are using their loops and everything, they're going to notice it for a split second. So you need to kind of um, prepare them for that. They blink a few times, it's gone. So that's really important for these hunters. Are they just going to the shooting range? Are they are they hunting for game to you know to provide meat for the family? Is it just you know what is it? Um, because they have to prepare a little bit to, to see that image and. Um, bow hunters as well, they will, because the sight is further out on their bows, um, they definitely will have to increase that peak sight by one or two sizes to get rid of that image for them. So it's just con conversing with them. I still tend to think the non-dominant eye is better to have it in, so it's not, you know, through the scope itself. Um, but they may have to make a couple of adjustments to where they're placing the sight if, if it is going in the dominant eye. Yeah, we haven't done any hunters, so I don't have personal experience on that, but that would make sense because you're right. I do at the slit lamp, if I get a little too close to my oculars, I find I can see it more, so I just bring myself back right. a little bit. I adjust my distance. Right. Right. Well, that's a really good point. That's, I'm, sure that, I'm sure we have a lot of questions around that, so um, good advice on that. Um, one last question. If, um, if you're counseling someone that's a, 
um, a mile post op. What what do you do differently as far as setting their expectations? Is it any different? Um, so basically, is it any different to um, counsel and deal with the expectations for a myo post op than it is for um, possibly a hyperope or an emetrope? Oh, 100 uh, percent. Because the myo is so used to, you know, like Patty was talking about before, they're so used to taking their glasses off and seeing absolutely perfectly up close. And then no matter what you do, even if, you know, we make them see much better than they ever did at distance, we put the inlay in so they now have good functional reading. Their reading will never be as sharp as it was before when they took their glasses off. So I know that for me, I always spend some time with them and make sure they understand that concept that we're going we're gonna to do a great job, but it's not going to be as sharp as it is right now without your glasses. We're just going to make you much more functional without glasses at all distances. And that is, that's crucial, especially your higher myopes that have been able to hold things so, so close and focus without any issues. And now having corrected that for them, they are, they're holding things at normal distance now, whereas they'll say, but I used to be able to hold it right in front of my face and, and could see it better. Right. Right, and, and it's, it's funny how they're like that. They, even though they could only see two inches in front of them before, their whole life they've gotten so used to being able to do that, being able to, if they couldn't see something, they would just bring it really, really close and see it really clearly. Right, right. Well, great. It looks like that's all our questions. Um, thank you, ladies, and thank you for our audience for the great questions. Um, before we end today, I just wanted to announce uh, a new tool that will be available to you really soon. Um, oh, we do have one more question, actually, before we go there. Um, so the question is, what age range is better for the minus 7.5 to minus 1 young presbyope versus leaving the minus a half for the older presbyope? I know for us, we've kind of moved to that minus 75 to minus 1 for pretty well everybody. I don't know if you're any different, Patty. I tend to look, um, again, at occupation. Um, usually I say they're, they're 52 or younger, going more towards the minus one. Um, if they're 53 or older, going for maybe the minus 75, but dependent on their, their occupation. Great, thanks. I, I think that is it. And if we get a few more in before we end, but... Um... I just wanted to announce this uh, new tool that's going to be available to you soon. Uh, we'll provide it to you electronically. So, you know, as you can see with that, we suggest that you consider working all the presbyopic patients the same way. So, um, as Patty and um, Sandra both told you, don't isolate these evaluations to camera only. You know, every presbyope, whether they're myopic or amotropic or hyperopic, should be considered a candidate for camera until proven otherwise based on objective or subjective you know, exclusion criteria. So to support your efforts in the clinic, we created this electronic booklet that's a quick reference guide for really everything we discussed today. It's called the Clinical Guidelines for Camera Inlay Candidacy. And um, I recommend when you get this from your clinical specialist or your regional manager that you share this with your other team members. Um, it's, we made it small, like the Clinical Pearls booklet, so, um, which you should all be familiar with, so that you can keep it in the exam lanes for easy reference. Um, they should be able to, they should send it to you soon, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that that's, uh, that will be available soon to help support what we talked about today. Good day, everyone, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>